Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to our first HOA workshop for 2024. I'm very excited to see all of you here. This is actually the session that was supposed to be presented last December, but we canceled it because we didn't have enough people. So I'm really happy to see all of you here. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the City of Greeley's website. So if you need to go back and watch it again, it will be available uh, probably within the next couple of weeks. I, before I introduce our speakers for tonight, I would like to quickly introduce Dennis Markheim with the City of Greeley Water and Sewer Department. He has some experience working with HOAs on water and sewer related topics. Dennis? Thank you. Yeah. Sure. They need a microphone. I've got a big enough mouth. Um, my, my role at Greeley Water and Sewer is I'm the key accounts coordinator. Generally, what that means is I deal with our biggest customers. Our, our most high profile customers are largest users. That being said, HOAs are still a very, very important part of what I do. Um, I assist our water quality department and our meter department and other departments when they have issues with neighborhoods because when we put a whole neighborhood together, it's a big customer. Um, we recently, for example, we recently set out a private system notification on there to a few of our customers and some of those customers were HOAs. Can you hear me okay? Sorry. Um, yeah. We, that's it. Okay. We recently sent out a letter to some of our uh, customers about uh, designating them as private water systems. Um, some of those customers were HOAs. And I didn't know if any of those were any of the room tonight. I figured there would be at least one. So uh, I just, when I found out they were doing this workshop, I thought it'd be a good opportunity for me to be available to answer questions for water and sewer related questions rates, regulations, and that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not going to take up too much of their time. I'm going to be here for the whole the whole meeting. But afterwards, if you have questions for me, by all means, uh, I'm a nice guy. Come and talk to me. Um, and I'll give out business cards as well. If there's something I can't answer tonight, I will write your name and contact information down, and I will get back to you. I promise. And so, right? Thanks. Thank you. God bless you. <laughs> now I would like to introduce our speakers for this evening. Melissa Garcia and Amanda Ashley, both with Altitude Community Law. Melissa Garcia has 25 years or more of experience. She loves community association law because it allows her to work with people to develop real solutions to challenging association problems. And she teaches and speaks nationally on HOA law. Amanda Ashley has experience as a criminal defense attorney and advocate for persons with HIV and AIDS legal experience with employment discrimination, estate planning, bankruptcy law, among other things, and now assisting community at community associations. With that, I'd like to welcome Amanda and Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to uh, get them to say that Melissa had more than a number of years, but that didn't work out for me. Uh, all right, so I'm Amanda. <laughs> and uh, tonight we're talking about silent documents. So what that means is when you have your documents, your, your governing documents, so your declaration, your CCNRs, your articles, your bylaws um, are primarily the ones we're going to talk about. And what happens when they don't say whatever it is you're looking for? Uh, so where can we get that HOA authority? All right, so there's a couple places that you're, as an HOA, when you're operating, where the HOA authority comes from. So the ability, the law, the rules that allow the HOA to, um, to act. And those are going to be from your governing documents. So the three I mentioned already, your, your CCNRs, which we call the declaration, your bylaws, your articles, and of course your plat maps. And a lot of times we skip over plat maps uh, unless we're kind of looking at the layout. Um, but I encourage you to check out the plat maps because a lot of times it will have very small print of things you actually might use. It's hard to re go buy a magnifying glass now. Uh, and, but it'll have things like if you have fencing questions or you're wondering about perimeter or you're wondering about landscaping. Any of that can sometimes be in the either the um, your plat maps. I'll have little notations about perimeter fencing or easements or you might have final development plans that were submitted. Um, we're not going to talk about those tonight, but that's all places you can find information. Certainly, these are the controlling ones. And then we get into the statute. So if you're not familiar with Kiowa, uh, you probably will be here shortly. That's going to be the Colorado Community Interest Ownership Act. 
and that is Title 38 of the Colorado statutes. It's actually 38-33.3. So if you walk out of here and you say, wow, I'm so jazzed up, I can't sleep tonight, I would start <laughs> here. Okay? Um, so it, it runs from uh, 101 through 402. Uh, there's a lot of different information in it, and it's going to govern associations. Uh, and Melissa will get into in a little bit here about you might have heard the terms pre-Kiowa or post-Kiowa associations, meaning associations who were formed after July 1 of 1992 are going to be Kiowa associations, and the ones before that are called pre-Kiowa associations. Uh, don't let that confuse you too much. We'll go through it. Um, but at any rate, part of Kiowa is going to apply versus all of Kiowa that might apply, depending on where you fall. The other thing we look at is the Colorado Nonprofit Act because our associations, if you look at your articles of incorporation, are incorporated in Colorado as a nonprofit. You're registered with the state. You should be filing Secretary of State. Um, you would have filed under Secretary of State, and then you're required to uh, make sure like your registered agent information is updated for your association. Some of you use management companies for that. Your registered agent, that's going to be the person that receives official notices. So in the event the association, for example, is ever sued by someone, whether it's a mortgage company or an owner or whomever, you would send it to the registered agent as listed on the Secretary of State. So you're going to want to make sure that's updated just so you get notice. Otherwise, you end up in a world of hurt. Uh, there's also the Colorado Condominium Act. That comes right before Kiowa, also in that Title 38. Uh, but that's going to be 38-33 versus Kiowa, which is 33.3, subtle difference. And then, of course, federal statutes. And when we're talking about federal statutes, those can be um, anywhere from the over-the-air reception devices. It's also called OTARD. That's going to regulate, like, your, your satellite, your TV antenna, um, fair housing, uh, disability accommodation, all of those. There's a number of federal statutes that impact uh, your association. You're not expected to memorize them all. There'll be a short visit to you. And any, any answer you don't get, right, I'm going to tag you with this. <laughs> I'd watch her. Uh, so a few things to keep in mind. Um, first of all, when it comes to looking at primarily our state statutes, you will occasionally see language in that that will say, unless otherwise provided. So what does that mean? Some of our state statutes, uh, if they are passed, apply across the board regardless of whether we're in an association or not. Um, flags and signs, that's one that now uh, passed. It says an association can't restrict flags and signs. Other laws in our state under even Kiowa, but other uh, outside of Kiowa, so the laws that affect, I don't know, pick your topic, they might have language in them that says something to the effect of, here's the law, unless otherwise provided in the governing documents. So this is what you have to do unless your declaration says you can do this instead. And so that's a difference you need to pay attention to because what you don't want to do is you don't want to enforce laws that uh, you're not required to, but you also don't want to only be looking at your governing documents and then forget that there's now this entire state law out there that says oh, you can or can't do X, Y, and Z, um, because then, of course, we end up in lawsuits, and I guess it's job security sometimes for some of us, right? But it's not a good idea. All right, the other thing to remember is just because your documents allow it, it doesn't mean you can do it. And what I mean by that, it goes back to the state law thing. So your document, I'm gonna use the flag and sign example, because that's just an easy one for me. Your documents might say, uh, nope, flags are allowed in the community, or it might, your documents might say only U.S. flags are allowed in the community. And if you were to only look at your document, you would say, well, no flags are allowed in the community. So you have to know that two years ago, uh, maybe three now, the state of Colorado passed a law that now states that HOAs have to allow flags and signs, and you can regulate certain things about them. You can regulate numbers of them, for example, but you can no longer outlaw them. You have to allow them, and it doesn't just have to be a political site, or it doesn't just have to be a U.S. flag. Um, so keep that in mind. And then authority, not duty. What that means is your documents might allow you to do it, but that doesn't mean you have the obligation to do it. Your documents might say you have the authority to make rules and regulations for community. 
But that doesn't mean that you should go out and uh, mediate neighbor to neighbor disputes. That doesn't fall under your purview as an association, for example. Um, and then, of course, the documents are not all inclusive. And that goes back to that silo thing I was mentioning earlier. If you only looked at your declaration and your declaration says our notice requirements are this, and you don't look at your bylaws or some of your older associations will have a bunch of information in the articles. And if you're not looking at all of those, you're going to miss one, in which point then you're going to end up with an argument over which one is the correct one. And you have an owner over here who's going to challenge or you're going to have the court if you bring a compliance action, let's say for covenant enforcement, who says, oh, no, 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 wait for it. You have this issue over here. So we always want to look at all of these um, as an all encompassing <laughs> Uh, dissent. For we want to look at all of them so that we're making a decision based on an all encompass uh, all encompassing the documents as opposed to just looking at one or two. And you'll notice every once in a while that there might be a conflict between a document. There might be articles of incorporation which ended up having a board member provision, and it says you have to have three people on the board, and your bylaws say you have to have five. And so you have to pay attention to those and. And then you have to look for things like conflict provisions. What that means is there might be a document that the bylaws might say, if there's a conflict, the bylaws control. So it's all kind of supposed to work together. Now, of course, it rarely does. And this is why. Because sometimes we create documents in silos, right? <laughs> so we create a document over here. Maybe the declarant, the developer created the articles. And then you had the attorney do the bylaws later, and maybe you've had the, I don't know, the board decided to do an amendment on their own, and so suddenly we have three different documents. The other thing is that documents, we don't update them very often. Sometimes our documents are 10 years old, 20 years old, but the pace of the legal changes that are coming through, the documents aren't going to keep up with them. And you're not going to be in a position where your association wants to spend the money to update the entire document every year. I mean, that would just be a waste of time, right? So we try to keep the documents as updated as possible. We recommend looking like every 10 years at your declaration. You can do it sooner if you, if you have it in the budget. But more importantly, paying attention to those changes that come down. For example, right now, there's about 24 to 26 different bills that have been introduced into the legislature that are either directly impacting HOAs or impacting them peripherally, meaning it's probably going to affect some of them, but not all. And so we're watching those come through the legislature. Now, do I think all 26 are going to pass? Probably not. Um, but boy, that's a lot of bills to keep up. And, you know, you'd update your documents this session and the next session, who knows how many are going to be introduced this year or next year. So we always want to keep an eye on that and kind of um, get to the point where we're at least aware is somehow remotely that our documents aren't the be-all end-all, right? We can't have the narrow, um, the blind focus. All right, so we're talking about pre and post Kiowa and the on or after July 1 of 92 and then pre-Kiowa. So if you are a pre-Kiowa community, so you your community was created, your declaration was recorded prior to July 1 of 92, I don't know why they chose that date, actually. I don't know. Do you know how is that? I don't. Okay. I actually know everything, but I don't. <laughs> he got said that. Answer for us. Um, he really does usually know everything. I'm going to I should throw this frisbee over there. Uh, so if you're July 1, 92 to present, all of Kiowa is going to apply. If you are pre-Kiowa, there's only certain provisions that apply, and those are going to be listed in Section 117 of that Title 38-33.3. And there's Budgeville. Just... All right, so let's talk about what you can and what you can't do. If I can get my little mouse to work here. I'll show it. Okay. Uh, so all Kiowa communities, this applies to pre and post, so it doesn't matter when you were created. The board has authority to adopt or amend the bylaws, except if you are trying to change quorum, the terms of the board of directors, you're trying to lengthen or shorten those, your director qualifications. Um, some of you might be aware of the Corporate Transparency Act that's coming out, which would require board members to register as board of directors. You have to submit personal information to the feds. Um, that may end up being a bylaw qualification you want to include for your directors, right? To say a director has to provide that information to be in compliance with federal law. 
Otherwise, they wouldn't be qualified to be a director, not because you want their information, just because that's what the law says. However, could you do that on your own as a board? The answer is no, because these are the exceptions. So what do you do? You would have to have a membership vote. Now, you'll notice in some of your bylaws, there will be a provision that says the board can amend, or there might be a provision that says the board can never amend on its own. It always has to have membership approval. But if your document doesn't say either of those things, then just know that you as a board have, or you as the owner with your board that you've elected, have the authority to do, adopt and amend the bylaws unless your document states otherwise, except for these exceptions. Yeah. All right. Well, you guys didn't tell me as I was wrong slide. They let me have all the All right. So uh, as far as that better, now I'm going to switch it to the next one when we go to... All right, um, so as far as adopting rules and regulations, you do as a board have the authority to adopt rules and regulations on your own, uh, at least by statute. Here's the caveat. Some of you will have really tricky little provisions in your documents. You might have a document that states the board can create rules and regulations, but it has to be approved by the membership. You might have a document that says the board has authority to create rules and regulations, and architectural guidelines, but you also might have a provision that says your board cannot create architectural guidelines, that's only the board, and you have to have a separate architectural committee. So those are all things you're gonna to wanna to watch for. However, in general, under the law, the board has authority to um, create those adoption, uh, create and adopt rules and regulations, policies, and um, uh, architectural guidelines, depending again on what your document says. Now, what you cannot do is you cannot vote on things um, under this rule in executive session. There's only about six things you can vote on as a board if you go into executive session. Um, adopting rules and regulations is not one of them, so don't do that. All right, now I'm going to go to the slide we were talking about earlier. Because mm -hmm. nobody told me. Melissa didn't throw a frisbee at me, so I didn't know. That's not good. All right, uh, budgets. You have the authority to adopt budgets. There are certain budget requirements that you have to follow with one exception for a pre-Kiowa community. So in general, bless you, you have the power to adopt and amend budgets. This is under 3833-3.3-302. You have the power to adopt and amend budgets for revenues, expenditures, reserves, and to collect assessments. Um, to do that, you have to follow a certain process. You have to mail via first class mail or otherwise deliver, like hand it to the person. A summary of the budget to all the unit owners including posting the budget to the website in advance. You then set a date for a budget meeting. A lot of times people will do it at the same time as the annual meeting and maybe have the budget meeting before, right? Um, again, it has to be a reasonable time after mailing. Your bylaws might require that meeting to be within a certain time frame, but if not, it's a reasonable time frame. And then you're going to have people come in and vote. However, unlike other things we vote on, other things, you have to have a certain approval amount to pass it, right? Well, budget under Kiowa, the budget is deemed to be approved unless a majority of the owners vote to veto it. So it's completely reversed in that respect. And you don't need quorum. It doesn't matter if quorum is met for your budget meeting. Now, as far as your pre-Kiowa community, um, if the declaration, number three will not apply if the declaration unless if the declaration sets a maximum assessment. So if your declaration says the board can approve budgets up to $600 and then after that it requires membership approval, then you would have to actually have an affirmative vote to pass that. But if it doesn't, then you're looking at majority veto, okay? There's mud so far. Yes. Uh, just let me, could you me to express the same doubts? Is it usually, um, the budget's in there, was, but it, the student had the question to say, do you agree with those, uh, you know, like with the 2024 uh, budget, and I the answer now, or? So if you're doing a budget meeting in person, you would have them, you would have them fill that out when they're there. Otherwise, if you're doing the action via mail, you could actually do the ballot that way. Again, I'm not talking about budget like, meeting, I'm talking about router expectation of a budget. So uh, let's give it the end, it was the opportunity to veto the budget. Because the others, that why do the members don't want to like veto this budget? So you could either have the actual, 
the budget ratification meeting and you could say, okay, governors, we're going to vote now. And you would explain to them if you, if we obtain 51%, which is majority, it would be vetoed. Uh, otherwise, it's deemed approved. Or you could send out those, ultimately, their ballots to vote yes or no. Um, and you could do it under the action without a meeting provision, which is in the nonprofit code. For yes. <clears throat> we do our budget within the annual meeting. Is that okay? I mean, we don't have a separate use Then clock in, clock out. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, except that you're trying to be quorum for, for your annual meeting. Yeah. And for your budget meeting, you don't need, you don't have to worry about quorum. So some associations, they've actually done it on a different day. I know a lot of associations will do it right beforehand. I've seen associations do it during. Um, I don't know if you have the recommendation or preference. And I mean, I think, I think Amanda just um, hit the nail on the head there. Because you need quorum for your annual meeting. Right. And if you do the budget veto process during the annual meeting, there's an argument that if you don't meet your quorum, then the budget veto process doesn't occur because you didn't meet your quorum. Um, but the statute, that's the one thing Kiowa says, you don't need quorum for budget veto. So that's why it's best to separate. So there's no argument that if you actually don't meet quorum, then you can't conduct the budget veto process. So I would probably do it right before, or right after the enemy. And then with the majority, it's if a majority votes to veto yeah. that, so then it so does our ends. Or any more, it's a majority or any higher percentage in your declaration. So some decks actually say 80% and that's fine. But so 10 people show up. Out of does it doesn't matter. Think that it's the yeah, yeah. the set, then it's good. Yeah. So even if your document saying you're in order to veto the budget, you need does fifty one percent of how many of the it first. Yeah, but fifty one percent of how many starts stuff not in the end meet it. But does that fifty one percent count as a veto in an annual meeting? They go to ratify it and they say they need these for this budget. Also, are they? Did you just say they showed up or they didn't show up? Fifty-one percent showed up or didn't show up at that. Oh, it's fifty-one percent did not show up because they had quorums with props. Yeah, so we're talking about the people, and there's that, and it's not all the products. The there's, like, there's a ton of There's a. It's not on the proxy whether or not um, is there a BB to this budget. Yeah, so here, here's my thing you're saying. So maybe 10 people show up, but then there's a bunch of proxies too, right? Right. That, that are collected and might make up the 51%, right? The proxies too? No. No. Like don't we make up? Okay, then, then no, you're done. If, let's, say, let's say you have 200 people at the meeting. I mean, 200 people in your community and you need 51% to veto it. So that's 101, right? and 10 people show up, or 30 people show up, or 50. As soon as you're done presenting the budget and answering questions, you're done. You don't even have to conduct the, the veto because right. not enough people showed up. But how do the gentlemen and she go go as they veto their budget? Why don't they know? So a notice goes out. Because on the, when they said that the animal meeting that was, it's not put on the animal Then that's a problem. Then that's a that's a problem. It absolutely should be put on the annual meeting cards. Since they it had say something to the effect of if fifty one percent or the majority votes to veto the budget would not be approved. Right. Yes. Public uh, one comment about that is that if the board is doing the job and providing annual required by Kiowa education, these people would know that they could veto it. And it's not required that they put it in the notification, just voluntary if you do to let everybody know. So board do your job, educate your members, and then they know us. Every now yeah. but that's a great job somewhere else. Yes. Calling is, is there a wolf for every household? Is there a wolf for the number of people in the house? So the documents should say, it'll say either like one vote per lot or one vote per unit. So if let's say my sister and I both own a unit, we can only submit one vote between us. So we either need to agree or fight it out, right? Gotcha. And three, All right, so uh, other, well, let me back up. So if it's you and your husband voting, the wife's vote counts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Nice <laughs> job. All right. Um, so other authority the board has in addition to that budget authority, you can enter into contracts on behalf of the association. Uh, again, this is if your documents are silent. Some of your documents are going to say that you have to have approval to do some of these things. So keep in mind that we're talking about documents that do not have those types of things in them. And you can file lawsuits on behalf of two or more unit owners on matters affecting the community. So if there is a a breach of contract issue, for example, going along with that. And you can retain a professional management company. Super cute. Okay, so we're continuing with all Kyo communities. You can also regulate the use, maintenance, repair, replacement, and modification of common elements as long as you comply with the requirements of 33.3-302.5. And that is the part, if you remember, was right after COVID and came out because a lot of pools were shut down a lot of common areas in general, but especially the pool thing was a big deal. And this law was passed at legislative session to require the association, if it's going to close down a common element for over 72 hours, you have to notify the owners, you have to place notices at each physical access point to, let's say the pool or whatever the, the common element is. Um, that notice has to have information about who the owner can contact if they have questions. So email, telephone number, and then it has to have a, um, Kind of an estimate of how long the the First. the amenity is going to be down, and that did it, it came right on the the heels of COVID as everything was kind of opening back up because of course a lot of owners were saying, well, we're paying and now we can't use the pool, and then the other owners were saying, well, we don't want the pool open because COVID, and and so anyway, so don't forget to comply with those notice requirements. Awesome. All right, here's other things you can do. You can impose fees and charges for use rental operation of common elements, not limited common elements. Now, what this means is if an owner has a, an assigned parking space, you cannot charge them for that assigned parking space. That would be a limited common element, right? You can't charge them to use their patio. That's a limited common element. You cannot charge an owner to use an amenity if they're using it for the use in which it was uh, developed to begin with. So if I'm an owner and I want to go use the pool and I pay assessments, you can't come in and say, no, you have to pay extra to use the pool. However, if I'm an owner and I want to teach a yoga class at the rec center pool side, you could charge for that because that's not the use for which it was intended. Uh, late fees, those are going to be imposed pursuant to your collection policy. If you remember, your association has to have its mandated nine good governance policies, one of which is a collection policy. That came out in 2022. You now have to offer an 18-month payment plan, so on and so forth. Your late fees are going to be listed in that policy. Um, if your late fees are already in your documents, you might see that it'll say the board can assess a late fee of, you know, I don't know, $25. Um, but if it doesn't, we can put it in care because by statute, you can charge that fines. They can be collected also and assessed and collected through your covenant enforcement policy, which is also a policy that had to be updated through HB 221137. However, regardless of what your documents say, you cannot charge over $500 total for a violation. And you have to give two separate 30-day notices in which an, uh, an owner has the right to cure whatever the violation is. You could not, um, there are some limitations to collect fines. So first of all, keep in mind that the fine assessment, the reason we have fines is to attempt to bring an owner property into compliance. It might seem punitive, but that is not, it's not meant to punish. It's meant to say, no, really, we want you to bring the property into compliance. Um, they shouldn't be used for punishment. They shouldn't be used and shouldn't have been used for just bringing in some type of income for the association. That's not the point of them. It's to bring the property into compliance. If you're using them for other things, it's a non-starter. And on top of that, um, while the association does have the right to collect and foreclose, the courts do not look favorably on high fines, particularly when other things are being paid, especially if the violation has been cured by the time we get to court. And on top of that, if you were to foreclose, which the association can foreclose on property, you can't foreclose for just the fines. Okay, so it'd have to be a balance due that consists of assessments, et cetera. We're going to keep going. It seems like a lot of authority, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, it's actually not when you get outside of these slides. But uh, so other authority that you have, you can recover reasonable attorney fees and costs for collections. <coughs> what that means is under um, 
certain portions of the statute under Kiowa that you are entitled to collect the amount you spend and you put it like a collection agency or an attorney, even without bringing that lawsuit against the person. That's only for collection of assessments. Covenant is a different matter entirely. You can record liens against the delinquent properties. By the very nature of all of us owning a property in an association, there's a, it's called a statutory lien against our property. So if I do whatever, if I go to redeem a house at a foreclosure, the association has that lien. However, what you can do as a board, if someone is behind on, think they're either their property's out of compliance or they're behind on assessments, you can record what's called a notice of assessment lien. And what that does is it triggers title in the event there's a sale to call you to say, hey, association, we need to make sure that we get this lien released. What does this person owe you? So on and so forth. So as the board, you have authority to do that, even if that's not listed in your documents. And then, of course, in the enforcement proceedings, you can seek reasonable attorney fees and costs. So a lot of times you'll see those if you have an owner who's out of compliance and the case had to go to court for whatever reason to get an injunction or to force um, you know, a shed to come down or whatever. Uh, the judge oftentimes will award attorney fees to the association if the association won, to the owner if they won. Uh, but if it's to the association, then you can... You can obtain those and you can turn around and then collect from the owner once they're awarded in the covenant proceeding. All right, moving on, you can also appoint volunteers to fill board vacancies. Now, I know you're really excited about this because you know how many people run for the board every year, right? So some of you might have boards that everybody's done for. Um, I often see that when there's been an issue that made everybody mad, the next cycle comes around and everybody wants to run for the board. Um, but sometimes people are just like, stands closed, fine, I'm going to stay home, guys are doing a great job. So what do you do when you don't have enough board members? Um, you, as a board, can appoint volunteers. They have to want to do it, guys. You can't just go out and say you're on. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's no volunteering. It has to be voluntary. You have to wait until they go to the bathroom. Right. <laughs> and they come out. Then you say, here's your floor. Yeah. Um, so you do have the authority to do that. So but I'm a board member. I'm a volunteer. I mean, what, what did, why do you say volunteers? Well, what I mean by that is I couldn't say Melissa doesn't want to be on the board and I'm going to make her. She has to actually want to be on. She has to volunteer. Pay up oh, so I basically say, was I volunteer you to uh, I'm sick of something? Right. Is that something you're wanting to share you? No. There you go. I volunteer coming up, but she said no. That's um, right. Yeah. So, you know, you want people that want to be on the board, which, of course, that's circular because some people don't want to be on the board. Go ahead. Is, is this an appointment in lieu of a membership meeting to, to elect them? No. So this is, let's say you have an annual meeting where you didn't meet quorum and you have somebody whose term is expired and doesn't want to run anymore. Or let's say you have someone or annual meetings in October and I resign today. You can appoint Melissa, assuming she's on board, to finish out until the meeting. That expired term. But, mm -hmm. but basically, if you don't have enough volunteers to, to run to the board. You're still sunk. You, you, you can't just appoint somebody, can you? Well, no, they have to want to do it. Right. Yeah. Like, you can't just randomly say, hey, Jim, you're on the board now, because Jim's going to go, no, thank you. Some of our documents say that basically they serve until they're relieved, duly relieved. And so basically they stay on the board even though their term expires. Or even though they design, they're still on the board until they're duly relieved by someone who's elected or appointed. Yes, except Kiowa states that they stay on the board and their term continues unless they resign. So even if your document says no matter what, they can't resign, Kiowa allows them to resign and then you could appoint somebody to finish out the term. Go ahead. So, for an example, we had our annual meeting and one of the board members wasn't present, but their term had ended. The current board, we have quorum, they... Oh. This. Motions to keep them on the board. So we said to start in the motions cask. Is that a way to continue that board member's term? If they're not present to take yes. Did you have anybody else run over the board? No. Okay. So assuming they wanted to, it was, but if they come back and they say, I didn't want to run anyway, you can't force them. Right. So at that moment, they, they, yeah, they just say, see you later. And you'd say, great. Now we got to find somebody. Cool. So, yes. Uh, okay, you have the power to elect or remove officers. Now, this is different than 
uh, electing board members. If you are the president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and the rest of the board says, we don't want you to be treasurer anymore, you can be removed from that position. You would still be on the board. You would just no longer be an officer in that position. Or say, we don't want you to be treasurer. We need to move to secretary. You can do that. But what you can't do is if they're elected to the board by the membership, you have to go through a recall meeting. You can't just say you're off the board. All right. Um, the other thing you can do as a board is utilize the court petition process. And that is a whole can of words. So um, the gist of it is that if you're trying to pass an amendment to your declaration, let's say, and you can't get quorum, so maybe you get 30, what is it, 33% of owners to show up and say, well, we would vote for it, but you need 50 owners to make quorum, you can go through the court petition process. And that means you file the documents with the court, you have to notice all the owners, you have to notice all of the um, mortgage holders of first security interest. You have to have at least uh, one annual meeting. You had to send notice out twice to um, owners. And then you have to prove to the court that more than 50% would vote in favor of the amendment. You can get it passed through a court order. So it's, it's a lengthy, can be lengthy, and it's expensive. It's cheaper if you can just do a lot of um, grassroots campaigning in your association to get people on board, informational meetings, et cetera. But you do have the option um, to do a court petition, and it will help if you consistently cannot meet quorum. And it's an amendment that's important to the community. Um, now, there's going to be other amendments that you can still use it for, but if it's an amendment that's not favorable to your community, they're just going to show up the court petition process and object. So you don't want to use it in that case. You want to use it when you just you couldn't get the numbers. Um. Is it you? It's me. Oh, that's good. It's one to keep it in. Yes. It's me. Run straight to read that data. Okay. So we're moving on. A shape. Oh. No. Yeah, you could be my slide turn. Yeah. Okay. Great. So um, the, the next piece, so Amanda was talking about things that were available to all associations, whether they were pre or post. Um, default authority. These are, remember the, the name of this class is hidden powers. These are things that are allowed per statute, even if your governing documents don't expressly state that you have the authority to do this. So now we're moving on to post Iowa communities only. These are associations, again, that are created on or after July 1st, 1992. This, this section talks about what Kiowa says that post Kiowa's associations have certain authority, even though not expressly listed in the documents. So the first thing I wanna talk about is making additional improvements to the common elements. So what does that mean? That means just you have a, an open space, a park, and you want to put in, you know, a new playground or you want to add something, some sort of improvement, landscaping, whatever, to the common elements. You have the authority to do that, even though your documents don't say anything about it. And this is for post Kiowa community associations. What about change in use, though? I'm going to ask you this. Has, it, has anyone here ever replaced their... I don't know, playground with a parking lot or something like, or just thinking about that. Because that, isn't that a change? Isn't that a, an additional improvement that's added to the common elements? Has anyone ever wanted to do that? No one? Okay, well, if you're wanting to do that, Kiowa does say for post-Kiowa communities that you could add improvements. But be careful. If you're going to, for example, I hear this all the time. People want to shut down the pool because nobody uses it. Or they want to shut down something else, the hot tub, because it's too expensive to carry on and to maintain. So they want to shut it down and replace it with something else that they need, like parking. This comes up quite a bit. So if you're going to do that, post Kiowa communities do have the ability to do that. But it's one of those things that Amanda was talking about, hey, you have the right to do it. And do you just really want to do that as a board without first, for example, um, seeking input or feedback from
from homeowners. There was a case in California where this is exactly what an association did. They, they removed uh, this grassy area this and this park and, and everything, and they replaced it with a parking lot because they knew as a board that is what everybody needed. And it was, it was terrible. People were coming back saying, we knew you had the right to do this, but why didn't you even do a survey? Why didn't you even ask us? We, we want this. Even though we need parking, we would rather have the, you know, the grassy whatever. Same thing with a removal of improvements. So if you are, anybody here have a pool or a clubhouse? How many people have rec facilities? Raise your hands. Okay. So rec facilities and pools, they're expensive to maintain, right? If you were ever thinking of closing down the pool, you might have the authority to do so, but one thing you want to remember is if your declaration, if your CCNRs and your map actually say a pool is available, if you see that term, swimming pool is available, and you just decide to close that pool down, then that would cause a problem because you are representing to future owners that if they buy into the community, they will have a pool. So even though you might have the right to close the pool and get rid of it and replace it with something else, make sure you look at your documents to see if it's there. And if so, you might have to amend your documents to get rid of that representation. Okay, all right. Um, acquire and convey real personal property. That's just That just means that you can buy equipment for your rec facility. You can, um, you can sell personal property of the association. But it says excluding common elements. So just keep in mind, if you have a lot or a tract or some kind of common area that's owned by the association, you don't have the right to sell that without owner approval. Okay, That requires at least 67% of the homeowners to approve. It might even be more in your documents. So common elements, just keep that one out. Grant easements, licenses, and leases over common elements. This is another uh, standard thing that I see sometimes. Do you have anybody in your community that abuts the, their lot abuts the common area and they want to, one second, they want to add landscaping or something pretty to that common element that's right up against their lot? Does anybody ever have that situation occur? Yeah, okay, we got a couple. So in that situation, the authority of the association to grant an easement to those homeowners is available to post Kiowa communities. But just keep in mind, if you're gonna have somebody uh, install landscaping, well, that's one thing, but what if you're installing a hot tub? Or what if you're installing a gazebo? Or what if you're installing something that could actually increase the exposure to liability of the association because now there's a new improvement sitting on the common elements that you allow. If you're ever going to grant any kind of easement or license or allow somebody to install anything on common elements, you wanna do that with an agreement saying, we will do this, but you are now accepting future maintenance or future liability, everything to condition that approval so that the association five years from now when the homeowner has moved is now not on the hook for maintaining that common element improvement. Yeah. Um, the situation we had is we had common element that went along the whole east side of our HOA. Okay. They built apartments to the east in Hope the Glen. Uh -huh. And those apartments took over all of our easement with their own landscaping, but yet it's still registered as HOA property. So the, the, the comment was that they that you had some common element that was all along the east side of your property and the neighboring apartment complex started building on that property without your approval. Okay, you need to call me, I'm going to sue them. Yeah, seriously, I mean, I don't know how long that's been going on, but they can't just build on your property. Hey. Yeah, okay, my card's right there. I read. So, so there was a situation here where an easement was actually purchased uh, from the original developer. So the original develop is there any developers in here, builders in here? Can I make developer jokes? No. So the the uh, the builder, the developer can do what they want initially, and if they sell easement rights that are not contrary to what the homeowners are able to. Uh, and if they sell it during the development period, because during the development period, they have a lot of additional rights to 
do a lot of things. And so if they act within their rights, then they're then that's probably an appropriate purchase. So okay. All right. Uh let's see. Next one. Access. Oh, let's see. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> She's fast. All right. So access units for maintenance, repair, or replacement of common elements. Who in here is it in a condo community or a town home community? Okay, a few of you. So this is important in terms of getting inside a unit because the association needs to maintain the common elements that are only accessible inside the unit. This is a, it's a common provision that you see in documents, but if you don't have that provision in your documents and you're a post Kiowa community, then you have the ability to access units. But the issue usually is, um, where you may or may not have language in your documents, is who pays for that inspection. So for example, if there's a water leak and you need to get inside a unit to see where that leak's coming from, who pays for that inspection? If you find out that it's the homeowner's uh, issue, can you charge it back? <laughs> Neither of these provisions, paying for inspection or charging back, is something that is automatically granted by Kiowa. Even though you have the right to enter into the unit, if you're post Kiowa, to to maintain, repair, and replace the common elements doesn't necessarily mean you have the right to charge back. Same thing for, for even uh, single family homes where you have outside landscaping and let's say you need to get onto the property to do something, doesn't mean that you have the right to charge it back. It just, if there's common elements that are located um, somewhere within the lot boundaries or the unit boundaries you need to get to it, then you have the right to do it, but not necessarily charge it back. So you might have to eat, eat those costs. Somebody have their hand up. Yeah. Well, can you make it a provision in the rules or regs? Can you make it in a provision in the rules and regs that you could charge it back? So you could, but there's no support for that. No clear statutory support. There is support to adopt rules and regulations, as Amanda said. So you, it's not as strong as I'd like it to be, but it makes sense to say, look, if we find out after going into your unit that the reason why all these water leaks are happening is because you failed to maintain your water heater, then it makes sense to be able to charge that back. It's just not very clear. Uh, it's not in the statute. It would be better if you're in the neighborhood of amending your documents to put that exact language in your declaration. Okay? All right, so terminate declare contracts. Actually, can you grab me mice? <laughs> My computer. Yeah, it's copy too. <laughs> Just a minute. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I, don't know. <laughs> I wanted to point out anybody in a um, declarant controlled association right now, still in the developer stages now okay so i just wanted to it's not that important then but i wanted to let you know that if you were just transitioning from developer control so the homeowners now are electing the board then you can actually terminate contracts that the developer has entered into things like the management contract any kind of employment contract leases for parking areas or facilities those kinds of things so for any if there's any ma managers in here who have developer controlled associations Within 90 days, I believe it is, yeah, 90 days uh, notice to the developer, you can actually, and the contractor, you can terminate those contracts. Okay, um, add interest on delinquent assessments. So for post Kiowa communities only, you if you don't have the right to charge interest for delinquent assessments, you have the right under Kiowa. Only interest, and it's capped at 8% per mm -hmm. the current statute, and this is not available to pre-Kiowa associations. So any associations that were created prior to July 1st, 1992, they don't have the right to add interest. And make sure that you know this is stated. If you're gonna add interest, it's not in your, in your declaration. You can only go up to 8% per annum. Put that in your collection policy. Okay. Next slide, please. All right, so now we're moving on to the Nonprofit Act. I mean, we, we are really focusing on Kiowa. Now we're going to talk about the Nonprofit Act. Now, the Nonprofit Act is another uh, statute that governs associations, but it really only deals with more operational things like meetings and records and notices and proxies and those kinds of things. 
instead of the use rights or assessments or maintenance provisions, all the MEEPs, that's really in Kiowa. Nonprofit Act is uh, more about operational stuff. So for pre-Kiowa associations only, under the Nonprofit Act, you have the right to borrow money, even if it's not stated in your documents. And under, if you're a post-Kiowa community, this is a big deal. Boards can just borrow money. You know, and there's nothing that requires them to get owner approval or anything. So for, that's for pre-Kiowa associations. For post-Kiowa associations, you also have the authority to borrow money, but you have to have in the declaration a statement saying that you have the right to secure the loan with an assignment of income. So if you're a post-Kiowa community and you want to borrow money as an association, as a board, you have the right to do so without homeowner approval and both pre and post, just borrow. However, all banks want income as collateral for that loan. And for post Kiowa communities, you have to have language in the declaration saying you have the right to assign income, future income, as collateral for the loan. So there, there's the difference. If you're pre Kiowa, you can borrow however many you want, whatever you want. No owner approval, nothing has to be stated in the documents. Um, and that's the pledge income stream that I was talking about. So also for pre-Kiowa associations, you can convey common elements. In the last slide, we talked about post-Kiowa communities not being able to convey common elements without homeowner approval, 67%. For pre-Kiowa, you do have the right to convey common elements without any homeowner approval. And this is, again, pre-Kiowa association. So unless you have some kind of limitation in your documents, and we're talking about when the documents are silent, you have the right to essentially sell common elements of the association without any homeowner approval if you are um, a pre kiowa association. Amend bylaws. I know we talked about this earlier about the right for boards to amend the bylaws without any kind of homeowner approval. There were certain exceptions. So for pre kiowa communities, the board can amend the bylaws without any homeowner approval, except for quorum. Quorum is the only exception, and the other exception is unless the bylaws prohibit it. So you need to look for whether or not your bylaws actually say the board is prohibited from amending the bylaws. If they say that, you can't amend the bylaws. But if they don't, pre kiowa boards can amend the entire set of bylaws except for the quorum. So how many here have bylaws that are older than like 15 or 20 years old? Okay, I'm gonna tell you right now, probably those who raised your hand, I'll, I'll bet you 20 or 30% of those bylaws are contrary to Colorado law. Because for the last 20 years, there have been changes every single year that serve to supersede your bylaws or add new requirements. So just be careful. Uh, you may think you're doing a great job following your bylaws only to be following illegal provisions. So if you're pre kiowa this is the time to do it. You can amend the bylaws without homeowner approval except for quorum and unless your bylaws prohibit it. Okay, next uh, slide. So the next thing that um, all communities can do is, I think we might have talked about this al al already a little bit, but vote by mail ballot. So that's also under the Nonprofit Act. And it's essentially anything you can do as an association at a meeting, you can do by mail or you can do outside of a meeting. And there's just certain hoops you have to follow. You have to send out the proposed. Usually people do this for um, approving amendments, for example. And you send out the proposed amendment with a ballot, a deadline to return it by a certain time, and then you can take action outside of a meeting. So that is available to all communities. You can also create committees. How many people here have committees in their association? Okay, what kind of, anybody other than an architectural review committee? You said a new full. Design review, same thing. What, what, what do you have? Design review? Landscape. Landscape committee. What else? Social. Social, great. Capital projects. Capital projects, okay. Anything else? Committee. What, fence? Yeah. Fence. Okay, so th this is great. So committees are fantastic if people use them and people are actually willing to serve on committees because what they do is they 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 take on whatever the actions that the board is typically going to take on and they help the board so landscaping you have to 
hire a new landscaping company. Maybe you have a committee that's addressing the landscaping issues or social committees. You want to have a party. You know, you get the social committee. What I love about committees is it, it helps those who are serving on the committees then maybe be prepared to go on to the board because now they know what's involved and they get, I see some laughing and shaking, and no, there's no way to get them on the board. No, the committees are great, great ways for almost to interview somebody to be on the board because it, then they, they have certain parameters and a scope of duties and reporting and all that. So they, so they can be part of the project, it's great when you have board members that get elected to the board, all of a sudden there's this invisible wall that goes up, you against the, the, the homeowners, right? And that shouldn't be that, it shouldn't be that way. So with committees, it helps to spread the ownership of various projects all throughout the community. All right, so um, hold meetings via telecommunications, that's the Zoom meetings. There's The law hasn't really caught up with COVID or Zoom or anything. So it's not like something in the statute say you can you, you know go online. But there is a provision in the Nonprofit Act that says as long as the method or the mechanism you're using allows everybody to hear each other at the same time, right? So you have a Zoom meeting, for example, as long as everybody can hear each other in real time, then you can go ahead and meet that way. And that's how you can get the Zoom meetings in. And you can also amend certain portions of the articles, not that that's really a big deal, but uh, that allows uh, all communities can amend certain portions of the articles. Okay, next, uh, don't forget the next page to always, uh, to modulate it, okay. So, <laughs> I know. Uh, to always check with legal counsel if you are unsure or have questions. And uh, that is, that's so key. I'm not trying to line my pockets or anything, but don't just jump into something without seeking counsel. Uh, if you, based on this class, for example, we're giving you these general provisions that discuss what hidden authority there is, but you really ought to talk to your legal counsel to get, guess what? Maybe you think your documents are silent, but I get, I'll bet you anything there's something in there that addresses what you're talking about, but you have to have the attorney to find it. So be sure to, to check with your attorney first. Okay, so we are going to move on to a different subject now. Thank you for doing that quickly, Amanda. Okay, silent documents two. Now, this first part of the class was what, so, what hidden authority do you have as a board um, even if your governing documents don't provide that authority to you. And that's because you have the authority in the statute. Now we're gonna turn it around completely and say, what hidden limits are there on your authority, even if the documents say you're entitled to do that? So we're gonna go act absolutely the opposite direction, which is even though, I'll give you an example, it's not in here, I'll give you a perfect example that, that comes up all the time. Most documents say that you can't install a satellite dish without architectural review or design review approval. Most documents say that. That violates federal law. So there's one example right then and there, because federal law essentially says that a homeowner or an occupant um, has the right to install certain protected satellite dishes, which will, I think we might talk about, I don't know. Certain protected satellite dishes those ones that are a one meter in diameter or less, they have uh, a right to install them without uh, unreasonable delay and requiring them to fill out a form and tell you what they're going to install is an unreasonable delay. That's a perfect example of where a lot of associations have no idea that they're violating federal law by requiring approval. Now, what the law does allow you to do is adopt location preferences and installation preferences. You just can't require prior written approval. Okay, yes. Does it also allow for size? Um, yeah, well, it, it, it only, yes, it only applies to those satellite dishes, not those huge ones that they put in the back here, but the little ones that are one meter in diameter or less. Okay, all right. So we're gonna talk about what I call the, the, pub, the prohibitions contrary to public policy. And 
in Kiowa. If you don't have a copy of Kiowa, it's on our website, and that's on the last slide. It's on the homepage. You can just download it. We keep it updated every time the statute changes. We keep that updated so it's always up to date with the newest laws. There's a section, a couple of sections of Kiowa, 38-33.3-106.5 through 106.8. Those are what I call provisions that are contrary, uh, that, that address things that are contrary to public policies, things that if you don't allow them, then it's contrary to the state public policy. Patriotic things, political, religious expression, fire prevention, all of that. That's in those three provisions. And those are the ones you want to look at in Kiowa when you're trying to figure out, well, do I have the ability to do this? I mean, Amanda just talked a little bit about flags, which we'll talk about. Do I have the authority as an association to regulate or ban flags because it says so in my documents? Look at those sections because it's going to limit a lot of your authority. Regardless, it supersedes what's in your declaration. So essentially, in the beginning of, those, of that first provision and also 6.5, I don't remember if there's a 6.7 or not, but at the very beginning of those provisions, it says, notwithstanding any provision in the declaration, bylaws, or rules, regulations, to the contrary, an association shall not prohibit. And there seems to be things that are added every year to this. So there's a lot of um, limitations on board authority uh, moving forward. So we're first going to talk about solar panels. Now, how many of you have dealt with solar panels or having people request solar panels? We've got a couple. Okay. So solar panels is a perfect example. Also windmills, but we don't have too many that are uh, dealing with the windmills. But solar panels are considered renewable energy generation devices. And those devices, solar panels, are protected under one of those provisions, 106.5, 1.5, which means that the association cannot ban from property that the owner owns solar, solar panels. They can't stop somebody from installing solar panels to property that the owner owns. I underlined own because that's really key to your regulation authority over condos versus townhomes versus single family home. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so as, as, if it falls within the definition of a solar energy defined, a device as defined in the statute, then you cannot ban. It doesn't matter what your documents say. Uh, next slide. What you can do is you can adopt reasonable aesthetic provisions on dimensions, placement, or external appearance, as long as those regulations don't increase the cost of that solar panel by 10%, more than 10%, or decrease its performance or efficiency by more than 10%. And, and when you're trying to figure out the 10%, you know, what you're really looking at is, is the solar panel experts and what they charge and how much more. So for example, if you say, we need you to do this in order to install your solar panels and at, just using, a, if it's $1,000 to put up the solar panels and all of a sudden now it's 2000 because of what you have required as a rule of regulation, that's not going to fly under the statute. It can't increase in more than 10% or decrease the efficiency. You can also require prior approval. I know I said you couldn't do that with satellite dishes, but you can with solar panels. And you can adopt bona fide safety requirements. And same thing with wind generation devices, you can adopt reasonable restrictions to reduce sound. So let's go back, can you go back one slide, Howie? Right. Let me, can, can I go back really quick? Okay, let me just get through this and then we'll take your question. Although you asked many questions oh, tonight, ma'am. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you've reached your quota. <laughs> My bouncer here is going to kick you out. Okay. Huh. All right, so um, cannot ban from property that the owner owns. So what does the owner own in a condo? Oh, there's your question, yeah. So in a condo community, the owner only owns the airspace inside the building. They don't own the roof. They don't own the side of the building or outside. So with condo communities, you can absolutely prohibit them because if they want to put it on the roof, they don't own the roof. And this statute doesn't protect them, uh, protect that roof. 
How about single family homes, regular detached single family homes? What do they own? Everything. Everything. They own the house, they own the land, they own certain, the lot boundaries and everything. So they own the mortgage, yeah, they absolutely own the mortgage. So uh, solar panels, if they want to install solar panels on their roof, they have the absolute authority to do so, but you can make them go through the architectural review process. You can adopt the reasonable aesthetic provisions and all of that. Who here lives or manages a townhome community? Anybody with, we got a couple? Okay, townhomes are tricky because with townhomes, they, they look kind of like condos. Some of them are stacked side by side, you know, some of them do. But with townhome communities, the association typically maintains the exterior of the building, the roof, the whatever, but the owner owns the building as well as the roof and the lot. They're just like a single family home, but, the, but they're usually attached to another home and typically the association maintains the exterior. So that's, that's important because if a townhome owner wants to install a solar panel, they have the right to do so on their roof because they own it, even if the association maintains that roof. But what you can do, similar to what we discussed before, is you can request them to enter into an agreement saying, yes, you're, you're allowed to put out the solar panels, but if, you, if your solar panels damage the roof, or if we have to maintain the roof, you have to take off your solar panel and then reinstall it later. You can have them uh, have the approval of those solar panels conditioned on some of these um, additional maintenance exposure and, and liability exposure, just as we discussed in, in, I don't even remember what we were talking about before, but at any rate, you, it's different with townhomes because they own the roof, but the association maintains it, yeah. I mean, our community is a combination of condos and townhomes. However, we are registered as a condominium community. So it's a combination of townhomes and condominiums, but you're registered as a condominium community. I'll bet you anything that your townhomes in there are just townhomes styled condos. They look like townhomes, but I bet you they're condos. What you need to look at is see how the declaration defines ownership in the townhomes. And if they say the same thing as in the condos, which is you only own the airspace um, within the perimeter walls, boundary of floors and ceilings, then they're probably just townhomes styled condos. They look like townhomes, but they're, they're condos. Or they could be true condos. I don't know, I haven't seen your docs. So I don't know, <laughs> but it's important for you to, to figure that out because when it comes to solar panels and people wanting to put them on condos versus townhomes, there's different authority, say the one. Okay, let's move on to flags. And, and Amanda talked about this a little bit earlier, but flags is another, th this law changed, it was different two or three years ago, two or three years ago, the law was that you couldn't prohibit political, or I'm sorry, US flags or military flags. That was the law a few years ago. That's gone away. Now, both flags and signs are different now. Uh, I think Amanda's gonna talk about signs, but flags, you cannot ban any kind of flag or regulate any kind of flag based on subject matter, message, or content on a unit owner's window, in a window of the unit, or in a balcony adjoining the unit. So, um, you know, what does that mean? Content means message. You can't, for example, if somebody wants to put up a flag that says, I hate so-and-so management company, or I hate so-and-so board member, you cannot prohibit that. Because it's a, with the exception of commercial, commercial flags because the, the statute no longer allows you to regulate based on content. And the reason why this came up is because when the law was that you had to allow um, military flags and, and US flags and political signs and all of that, boards were in this position where they had to figure out what was objectionable or not. So you'd have somebody say something like, I wanna, you know, Blue Lives Matter flag up, and somebody else says, I want a Black Lives Matter flag up. And then all of a sudden, they're, they're, they're wanting the board 
to figure out what is objectionable or not. And that was in a terrible position for the board. So instead, they completely turned it around, said you no longer have the right to regulate or ban based on content um, with respect to non-commercial flags. Um, and commercial flags are things like for sale flags, for rent flags, or construction flags. Now you do have the ability instead to adopt reasonable content neutral rules regulating number, location, and size of flags and flagpoles. But you can't prohibit the installation of a flag or flagpole. So I, it says reasonable. So I want to I want to point out how that could be very different for a community again, depending on the type of community. So for a townhome or a patio home community, you might have this really tiny um, uh, front yard. Is it reasonable to allow somebody to put a huge stand uh, standalone flag that blocks everybody else's view because now it's taking up this space? Probably not. But if you have acreage or just a standard single family home detached home community and a regular front yard, then, then it would be reasonable to allow them to install uh, a standalone flag. But for townhomes or uh, condos, townhomes, having them mounted to the, the side of the house is probably more reasonable than having them put a standalone um, flag in front of the yard. Okay, and I am done for the night. See you later. No, I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm just kidding. I'm not done for the night. It's amended out. <laughs> I'm not saying it's stressful to do our slides, but I think we understand how I'm saying. Um, also, this is very important, and I'm hoping you're all with me. Did anybody else hear Joni Mitchell when Melissa kept talking about putting up a parking lot? <laughs> I did. I'm willing to say that. I am willing to see it. Okay. All right. And then she said tricky, and I was like, tricky, tricky, tricky. Okay. <laughs> so, signs. Signs everywhere. There's signs. Uh, signs fell under the same bill that flags did, which was HB 2113, 10, 20, 10 to law, July 2021. And it says you have to allow signs. <laughs> that was a big weekend for that, wasn't it? Um, specifically, you have to allow signs, but much like flags, you can create reasonable aesthetic guidelines regarding the number of signs, the location where signs may dis be displayed, and the size of signs, but you cannot regulate content. Now, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have an owner who's very, very pleased by this. It might even be you that says, that's fantastic. I've been wanting to fly this flag or put out this sign. And then that same person, which also could be you, is going to open their window one day and see their neighbor's flag or sign and say, well, I don't want that flag or sign. <laughs> so now we have to allow flags or signs. Um, you can regulate size. So you can say flags, three by fives. You could say signs, two by threes. What would not be reasonable is if you said it has to be the size of postage stay up. People get awfully upset about that. You would that up. You can prohibit commercial signage um, as far as the boundaries of the unit. So let's let's say condos. You can prohibit displaying the sign like on the uh, outside of the property, but you cannot prohibit it within the boundary when we're talking about condos. So condos, they could put it like in the window, for example, um, of the unit. They could put it on the unit, something like that. All right. Uh, what is a sign? That's an excellent question. I don't know the answer. It doesn't seem like everybody else does either. Because what we would, and I'm going to use the phrase common sense, so we can all agree it's not so common. You would say, well, a sign is a sign. And, but I can also tell you that we've had people argue that signs are actually what I would consider a banner or a flag. And we had somebody else claiming that a broken mailbox was a flag pole because they stuck a flag in it. So I don't know it's up for interpretation. But nonetheless, um, you can and should adopt a policy defining what a sign is. <laughs> But, and probably what the flag is, because otherwise you're going to have someone arguing that this is my sign. And it's maybe a handwritten piece of paper in the window, okay? Um, you would also define commercial signs, because you could argue a commercial sign may or may not be anything. So you could say commercial signs are defined or to include uh, for sale signs, construction signs, garage sale signs, etc., um, can you decide to allow more signs during certain seasons than others, like political election season? Um, probably not, only because that then is regulating signs. And even though you might be temporarily allowing more signs during that time period, 
uh, you probably are then going to have an argument from somebody else who says, well, I should be able to fly that many sides during this season. Uh, so you really, I would just get a policy and I would stick to it and you'd define all this in a policy and then um, will that solve all your problems? Of course it won't. That would be silly of me to say, but it'll certainly help. Okay. Now, what if you have somebody who's flying a gigantic sign with, uh, I don't know, flipping me the bird. Has anybody ever driven past like Aspen, right? Back, I don't know, I want to say it was probably 30 years ago. There was the big barn out there that was painted blue with the flipping the bird sign. And the legend was that his wife ran away with a pilot. That's a true story. I don't know if that part's true, but there was this barn out there. If you came through Aspen and you're heading down, you really get, you're heading towards like Assault Carbondale. Um, maybe it's against a municipal <laughs> ordinance. Maybe it could fall under your nuisance provision. Uh, I don't know because it depends on what you have in your declaration. I can tell you it's awfully difficult to claim nuisance. It's awfully difficult sometimes to prove nuisance. Uh, if it is against a local ordinance, if you have an ordinance in your municipality uh, or in your community, you can certainly call, but you know, we can't do in the four city ordinances because you're not the city. So you could call and you could say, well, Joe's over here flying in whatever. Um, and then the city can enforce it. Sometimes the city acts a little more quickly on other things, uh, some things more than others. So it just depends on kind of what their workload is, but that would be one option for you. Uh, but I would, like I said, it's not required, but I'd get a flag and sign policy in place because this is just gonna keep going. <laughs> okay, all right, that's it. It's your turn, ma'am. Okay. Okay, uh, now we're gonna move on to EV charging stations. Is anybody facing that right now with the electrical vehicles and people wanting to put these charging stations in their community? Anybody? I for it. I mean, just to convince your co You're trying to provide for it, but not to accommodate it, but to write up a vision. Okay. Okay. Tell me whatever you're going to say. Following whatever I'm going to say. Well, I'm going to say a lot. No. Uh, the EV charging stations, that, that is coming. I mean, with you... If you're in a townhome community or a condo community, mainly it's it's very important for your communities, because what the statute says is you can you cannot prohibit the use of or installation of an EV charging station on or in and it's a level one or level two. So it says what exactly the type of EV charging system on or in a unit. So that's also a lot within the lot boundaries on um, a limited common element parking space carport or garage owned by the owner or assigned to the owner in the declaration or other record recorded document so for condos a lot of the the units will also have assigned garages or assigned parking spaces now this is new on a space that it is accessible to both the unit owner and other unit owners that was added in uh, last year in hb 23 1233. So that means, in my mind, general common element, parking spaces, because everyone can access them. So that doesn't mean that you have to pay for it if they want to put in that EV charging station, but now you are required to allow them to install it, not just in their unit boundaries or their lot boundaries or in their limited common element spaces, but also in the general common element parking lot. But it, it's going to be at their, neck, at their cost. So next slide. Um, you can adopt safety regulations and here's key again for condo and townhome communities because if you if you are thinking about uh, i mean if, if people are approaching you for for these ev charging stations and you're kind of worried well how many do we allow before maybe it becomes there's no more capacity or maybe it becomes a hazard or a fire hazard or something we don't know now is the time to be talking to your experts about Let's say you have a garage that has 20 car spaces in there. You should be talking to your expert now and saying, how many can we install, how many of these systems, before it actually becomes a hazard or some kind of safety issue? You should be paper trailing that now so that at the point where homeowners are, are, are uh, wanting to install these and you only have a certain amount of spaces, you should have that expert opinion saying only up until this space or this number after that it's no longer reasonable to allow any kind of ev charging stations so that's you should be talking about that now 
You can require reimbursement for actual cost of electricity provided by the association. So if you are able to um, uh, actually uh, uh, figure out what that cost is, because there's a submeter, and you can say this is the amount of energy that this particular space uses, and you can charge that actual cost, or you can charge them a reasonable fixed fee per month. I would talk to your the electric company or whomever to, to give you whatever that reasonable cost would be. But this is if you are providing that electricity to them. If they already have electricity to tip through their own system, then that doesn't really matter. But if they're still using your system, then you have the right to charge re costs for reasonable access to the electricity. You can adopt reasonable aesthetic provisions on dimensions, placement, or external appearance. So that's just not probably not not a big deal because a lot of the EV charging systems are, are pretty small and they're tiny. But you can you can go ahead and regulate the aesthetics. Yes. I have a question on the uh, charger stations. Can we require them to go through architectural review committee? Yes, we're going to get to that. We're almost. The reason why I ask is because a lot of homes built under. Uh -huh. Small uh, circuit breaker panels in. So a lot of the older small homes have the circuit breaker panels. Yeah. So they put a 240 in there to do their EV and yeah. overload the circuit breaker panel. That's Absolutely. What see, is supposed to be. That's exactly right. So the, the the issue was in certain communities, just plugging in a certain type of EV charging system, even though it's allowed, might overload the circuits, right? And that's what the architectural review committee is supposed to do, or the board and members reviewing it. Yes, you can. And that also fits into that adopt bona fide safety regulations. There's always that language that's inserted in the statute that kind of addresses that um, in an overall way. So, but we'll talk about that. The next, the next slide. So it's a common area like the streets. If that causes a problem with, causes damage to adjacent. We're going to talk about that. Yep, that's coming up. Okay, so the next slide, what if it's on a limited common element parking space, or I should also say the general common element. I'm sorry that didn't, uh, that didn't make it to that because the statute was just changed last year. But any kind of common element parking space, you can, or actually not you can, the owner must agree in writing to comply with the design specifications, hire a licensed registered electric electrical contractor familiar with the EV systems, bear the cost of installation, including if they damage the common areas, they have to restore them to the original condition. Provide insurance. There's all this stuff that you must put, you must get them to sign this in writing and to agree to it in writing because if it's a common element portion or area where they're gonna install it, that exposes the association to liability, which is why it doesn't require this if they're gonna put it in their own um, driveway for the single family homes, because that's their responsibility. But for condos and townhomes or anything where they're talking about common element installation, you require them to put this in writing. And you do that in conjunction with the architectural review request. Next slide. <clears throat> this is also key too, especially for condos. What if one homeowner wants to install the EV charging system and then they move? What happens to that system? Did, is it now inherited by the association? They have to pay for it? So if, if it, again, on LCE or general, sorry, just could change that slide, LCE or general parking space, carport car garage, owners and each successive owner assigned to that space are responsible for all that stuff, costs for damage, repair, maintenance, removal, or replacement, maintaining the insurance policy, and removing this system during any kind of maintenance of the common elements. So next slide. If the AV system is installed by a homeowner, it's their property, okay? So it's their property. Upon sale of that unit, if it's removable, they can take it with them, or they can sell it to the purchaser, or they can sell it to the association. If nobody wants it and it just stays there, the next owner is responsible for that maintenance and all of that. That last slide talked about the, the successive owner. So the owners are gonna have to discuss with one another whether or not this is something that, that they, they want to assume. And if they don't do that, they have to assume it anyway. So it's one of those situations, and then if they don't wanna have it there and, and don't wanna maintain it, then you can tell them to remove it. So it's very key that you get that into the agreement as well. 
only applies to residential units and does not apply to timeshare units. That's close. Stay out for Kevin and I. for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I were you, I'd run fast and fart. Uh, okay, zero escaping for condos and attached single family homes here, townhomes primarily. You have to allow zero escape. You cannot prohibit, you have to allow zero escape. Artificial turf or drought tolerant vegetative landscapes on property for which an owner is responsible. If the HOA is responsible for that property, you do not have to allow them to put in zero escaping. You can, of course, much like we heard about with everything else, really, we've been talking about tonight, is you can regulate the type, number, and placement of drought-tolerant planting and hardscapes. If it's property, the association is responsible for maintaining, you can prohibit. Um, we do have some associations that will also enter into like a maintenance and use agreement for that, much like um, Melissa was talking about with solar panels or even with the um, EV charging stations. Some associations want to allow an owner to have a little plot of whatever. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I'd recommend it or not. It depends on your association. <laughs> All right. Uh, for detached single family homes, your regular single family homes, you can't prohibit it either. And it can go on property to which an owner is responsible. Um, keep in mind, this could be property owned by an owner, maintained, a limited common element maintained by an owner, but it can also be like a right of way or tree lawn that the owner is responsible for. Right. What you can do with both of these, much like the attached, is you can adopt the aesthetic guidelines and rules. They have to be reasonable. So if you say you can have one cactus, that is not going to be found to be a reasonable guideline. Um, if the aesthetic guidelines can apply to drought tolerant vegetative or non vegetative landscapes, so that's when we're talking about like a little bit of rock and a little bit of succulents, et cetera. Um, and you can also regulate the type, number, and placement of drought tolerant planting and hardscapes. So, what you can do is you can say we're requiring that you have at least 80% drought tolerant. Um, for example, you cannot, like I said earlier, prohibit vegetative, non vegetative turf grass in the backyard, so you have to allow turf in the backyard. You cannot unreasonably require hardscape of more than 20%, so you can't say the whole thing needs to be rocks. You have to allow an option of at least 80% drought tolerant planting, so if you have a landscape design or a landscape committee, they need to be aware of this. And you cannot prohibit vegetable gardens in the front, back, or the side yard of a single family home. Um, when it comes to a condo, you're probably going to have somebody arguing that they want to have it on their patio. Um, again, reasonable. So what you can't do, you can't say you can have a garden and it can only be postage size, right? You can't say this. Uh, for your detached family homes, you as an association are required under that law to select at least three pre-planned water-wise garden designs for the front yard of each home for them to choose from. Uh, you you have to. It's part of the law. So choose three. Go to uh, CSU. They have the extension plan online. You can actually pick three downloadable designs. You can go to um, Botanic Gardens has some. You can go to a landscaper. It doesn't matter, but you need to figure out and have your board pick three that you would consider pre-approved. And what that means is that if an owner installs that one of those three pre-approved designs, they don't have to go through the approval process. Now you can still do a policy where you request that they notify you what they're doing so that when you walk by, you're not like, why are they digging holes in their yard? Uh, but you can't require them to do that as long as they're using the three pre-approved ones. Uh, again, for aesthetic guidelines, you can say it cannot exceed, I don't know, eight by 12 and it has to be made of cedar and it can be a raised bed, et cetera. Um, but you can't regulate the type of vegetables in the garden. We get a lot of questions, and I'm not quite sure why, but a lot of people get upset about somebody maybe planting corn. I have not seen corn planted yet, but for now about a year and a half, there has been an uproar over whether somebody going to plant corn in their front yard. Um, it doesn't matter because you can't tell them not to. Same with the other one I get was pot. What if somebody plants pot in their front yard? <laughs> Call the city. Call the county, call the state, see if they're growing it officially. I don't know, but you can't regulate the type of plant. Um, Barb, can we regulate how to spoil the plants? Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I think um, 
if you were to state that it is an aesthetic guideline, yeah. that you could, with the caveat being that that has not been heard in front of a court yet, and so we don't know if a court is going to state Once, yeah. you're allowed to have 10-foot high corn. I don't know. Um, but for purposes right now, you could call it a design guideline or an aesthetic guideline. Just know that that could be challenged. Um, are you required to allow, these are questions we get, required to allow an owner to plant veggies, plant vegetable gardens on the property owned by the owner if the association maintains it? And the answer is yes, because the owner owns the property and they're allowed to put the garden there, um, even if the association maintained it. So what do you want to do? You want to do one of those agreements we've spoken about a couple times now, uh, kind of a maintenance use agreement that shifts that responsibility for maintaining that to the owner so that the association is A, not trying to maintain an area with vegetable garden, or B, being um, accused of killing said corn places. Can you, uh, let's see, pre-approval as related to aesthetics only, so you could, like I said, say you have to notify us. We recommend you notify us that you're installing um, the, the garden but uh, you can actually, you can say it's reasonable to request that they are submitting plans regarding the aesthetics to make sure it's in compliance with your guidelines. Um, but you, you can't require them to go through a full approval process if they're choosing one of those three pre-approved ones. And you can have more than three, it has to be at least three. Uh, if the owner does fail to submit like an ARC approval and installs a garden plan that is still compliant with one of three pre-approved guidelines, please don't try to enforce the technical violation of failing to submit a form because it doesn't go well when you get to court and then the attorney or the um, owner gets awarded legal fees if they have an attorney and the court yells at the association for trying to enforce the form. Now, if the owner doesn't submit a form and installs a garden plan that's not one of the three pre-approved ones, that's a different issue because now it's just not a matter of a form so that you can enforce we had a question in the back, I think. Uh -oh. Okay. Yeah. I've got a quick question. What about your marijuana planting? Sure. It is a question I get a lot. <laughs> but you should imagine, can we put a restriction on it if they cannot grow it so it's much of purposes? So it's uh, the plan is on their own property. Yes, they can. Yes, because you can have three, I can't remember, it's three or six plants for your own purpose. Or you can that's right. right, but that's but a state because law. Because they don't complain, uh, comply with the law, can we just basically put a prohibition on not for commercial purposes? So that's a state law, and the association can't, or a city ordinance and a state law. You can't necessarily enforce that. What you would instead do is report them if you thought they were doing commercial purposes. But now, how would you think? Yeah, because it's going to be hard to enforce anyway. Uh, religious diplomacy? Yeah. Basically, and that leads me to another question. Oh, sorry. If they have to have a requirement to grow up commercially, it's a license, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then basically the car has to have a license to operate on a privately owned student. We can't enforce that if we require it. So you because could that's state law. There's some compliance ones. If you if in your documents it says you have to have a valid registration on your vehicle, you could fight for that. You couldn't tow. Right, because you own the city streets, but you have that right. Yeah, sorry, own the streets in your community, presumably, but you wouldn't be able to tow because you cannot tow under the towing bill for lack of uh, invalid registration. That's a specific exception you now under the bill that was passed last year. You can no longer tow for spider tabs. I mean, it's it's one exception among stuff that ends. So. Now into the state law. I thought we could tow it with 24 hours notice. Not for expired tax. So it, it carved that out for whatever reason. Well, okay. Other things, yeah, mm -hmm. you could expose. But we can't yeah. require current insurance. Uh, insurance? Well, if your documents require insurance, maybe. But with respect to the towing bill, it gives you certain exceptions that you can tow without any notice and then everything else at least 24 hours except expired tax. So okay, well, I'm not trying to tow up. I'm not. I'm just trying to make sure that their vehicle is currently licensed, registered, and has current 
minimum. Just use required. a different remedy. Just use a different remedy instead of dope. You tell me you can use a different rem remedy if they hit somebody walking out of the street and they have no insurance, their car is not licensed or registered, and we own the streets, we're files. But is that HOA responsibility to enforce that? It depends on your documents. Remember, what, what we're, because you're bringing up a situation where there's obviously, if there's something stated in your documents, you have a duty to enforce. All to be set legally allowed. To, yeah, exactly. To instead legally allow. So it really depends on your documents. If you're saying, should we do this? We do. And we're liable because somebody doesn't have insurance or doesn't have whatever, and they're driving, they hit somebody on a private street. Yeah, and even somebody that does have insurance, it might hit somebody on the streets. It's You're going to be not liable. You're going to be exposed to potential lawsuits because you own those streets. So where you address that is make sure your, insur your insurance is good, the association's insurance. Yeah, it, it's not a great answer, but it's that's all we got. Man. You say your documents. Yeah. That, does that mean the boards can put it as the rule and regulation of the association? Uh, if the streets are private. They are private. So are. common element streets that yes. you have broad regulation authority. Yeah. As long as there's something, as long as there's whatever the rule and regulation is not contrary to what's already in the declaration or state law, I'm going to say yes. You have broad regulation at the one declaration. But keep it on. I've been saying you all about it. It's a double edged sword, though, because if you have a provision like that that says you are requiring everybody to be insured and to provide proof of that insurance, and that someone does get hit by a car that is not insured, that is going to impute liability to the HOA because you've created this obligation in your documents, assuming you amended the documents, to state that the HOA is requiring people on your streets to be insured. So it goes both ways. You want to be careful with anything like that. In other words, you're going to have to monitor it and enforce it and make sure people have insurance. And do you want that additional role? I don't know. I don't know. So either. Yeah. Keep all this thing. You should wait. I the force that if I get into it. Any more questions on that, please, before we move on? We just have two more. In the back, did you have a question? Uh, I'm sorry, it's all connection to the marijuana. No. You know, vegetable gardens, they actually say they talk about pollinator plants. <laughs> marijuana plants are pollinator plants. So I'm looking at that going, the occupancy. But I have a cob that is thick, uh, like, uh, like, you know, you're allowed by state's laws, D kids, in a bro, three or you know, trees, lands, or whatever. Yes. But what about in Chicago's can can the uh, can the association regulate that? Yeah, yeah. So remember that the state law, the associations can still be stricter than state law. Okay, see. So if you if the state law says um, marijuana plants are allowed, and they and it doesn't say something like and no, it's no. No, it's stamping. Or no provision or declaration can be afford, enforced against that state law. Then you're kind of limited. But if it just says marijuana is allowed, you can, in your document, say marijuana is not allowed. Okay? You can be stricter. Same thing as if the city says chickens are allowed. You can amend your declaration to say chickens are not allowed. It's only if the ordinance actually calls out the enforcement of the provision. So if the ordinance or the state law says you must allow chickens and you can't enforce something contrary to that, that's when you have no regulation authority. So with the condo situation, with the marijuana that's being grown inside in the basement, I think you can you can amend the declaration to prohibit it outright, then you have to monitor and enforce it, or you can uh, regulate, allow it, but say, if you have the, doc the language in your documents, you can say any increased water usage because they need a lot of water to grow the marijuana or increased electricity, whatever. We're, we're going to charge your back to you. So I think it's going to depend on your documents and what are the very good. And it's going to be difficult to enforce. Right. Exactly. Because you're not going to be able to. How do you enforce it? That's one of the things that we always talk about is if you're going to amend, don't put, if you put something in there, you better enforce it or you're exposed to liability for failing. To well, I remember if it's grown on the inside of the unit, we in well, what circumstance would you have to go in though? Right. Like you might have a provision that says you can enter into a unit, but if I get in front of a court and I'm just saying, well, they thought there was pot in there, judge, right. 
it's not going to fly. The other part is under that HB 22-1137, you have to give at least two 30-day notices to cure it. So, and as soon as that plant is off or whatever your regulation is, it's cured. So now you've spent a lot of time going after somebody who went and hit the plant and the next door neighbor said, oh, here's a picture, it's cured, and then bring the plant back the next day, right? So there's a lot of enforcement issues with particularly under HB 1137. Okay. Uh, that actually, that, just jumping on that, short-term rentals, Airbnbs, anybody experiencing those or trying to regulate them? Okay, so short-term rentals, Airbnbs, under HB 1137, they're almost unenforceable. Because what happens is you have to give them 30 days to cure. You got somebody in there for a weekend, they leave, it's cured. You have to start over every single time, the way the law is written right now. So if it says no short-term rentals, nothing under 30 days, somebody comes in for three days and leaves, that violation is now cured. And so you can't then say, well, wait a minute, you know, they keep doing it. Well, the, the way the law is written is once it's cured, you have to start over and you have to give them 30 days to cure. It's kind of ridiculous, but we're trying to, we're hoping there's going to be some clarification on that. Yes, sir. That's nice. One of your blogs said that the way you, you kind of get around that mm -hmm. is you write the rules so that they have to share the income. So yes. So I'm going to so tell you, yes. Yeah. 75% of the associates. Let's, let's talk about that. So you're not, in that case, you're not enforcing it, you're embracing it. We have some associations down in Denver who have said, you know what, we're not going to fight this. We're going to allow it, but we're going to charge you. We want our cut. Every single time you, um, you rent it out, you're going to pay us for all the additional costs that we're incurring because you have people cycling in and out. That's one way. Another way that you may be able to do this without any amending, but with that you might be able to enforce it, actually you do have to amend, is to put language in the declaration saying not only are short-term rentals prohibited, but advertising them in any way. Because they have to have their ad up to be able to rent it, and if they have the ad up, presumably it's going to be for more than 30 days to be able to rent it. And so now you're enforcing that violation versus actually the use of the unit for short-term rental. So there's ways to address it, but it is a problem right now under the current law. Okay, so let's move on. Right now, we've just got two more. These are really quickly uh, religious symbols. This was several years ago, but essentially in, um, you can't prohibit the display of a religious item or symbol, and it's limited to the entry door or entry door frame. So if you have documents that say you can't um, install anything on the exterior of your home or your doors or whatever, this supersedes it, and anybody can put a religious symbol um, unless it threatens public health or safety, and I'm not sure how a religious symbol would do that, but unless it threatens public health or safety, hinders the opening or closing of the door, violates whatever state law or municipal ordinance, contains graphics, language, or any display that is obscene or otherwise illegal or individually or in combination with other religious system, symbols or items, covers area that is greater than 36 square inches. So when this law came out, I thought there was going to be a lot of um, discussion about it, but nothing's really happened. Just know that, this, particularly with condos and townhomes, again, when you're regulating the exterior, do not uh, prohibit religious symbols that fall within that particular uh, parameter. And also, you can require them to take it down if you need to maintain the door or paint the door. Um, and, but you have to provide them notice uh, regarding the temporary removal. And then just the definition of a religious symbol is an item or symbol displayed because of a sincerely held religious belief. So I'm not even going to say what that means. I don't know what that means, but uh, just err on the side of allowing it. Okay, so the next one is, the final one is child care homes. So many associations don't, don't know that you cannot prohibit daycare centers if they fall within these parameters. The exception are HOPA communities. Those are how, that's a, the HOPA community is a community that falls under the Housing for Older Persons Act. So if you fall as a HOPA, if you're a HOPA community, you can still um, prohibit daycare centers. But for the others, you can't. Even, and many provisions, declarations actually say very clearly, you cannot have a child care home or, or a daycare center. This supersedes it. But keep in mind that it has to be licensed. It has to fall within the parameters of this statute. So there's licensure that, that's required. 
If you think they're not licensed, then contact the city or contact the governmental entity and say, hey, enforce your own restriction. You can also, um, it doesn't supersede your standard regulations in terms of parking, um, landscaping, noise, and all of that. However, you have to make a reasonable accommodation for fencing. So if you have a daycare center, they want to install a fence, that makes sense because they want to you know, make sure that there's safety issues. So you do have to allow fencing. Um, you also, next slide, uh, require, own, you can require owners to carry liability insurance because a lot of times when you have a daycare centers, they're taking those kids over to the park. And so they're using your equipment and facil you know, your facilities, so you can require them to have insurance coverage um, per this slide, uh, which names the association as an additional insured, and it is primary to any insurance association is obligated to carry, which means it kicks in before any kind of association liability policy has to kick in. And that is it. Okay, so we're pretty early, which I'm very happy about, but uh, we have some questions. I have a question in Island by law that says that we cannot, you cannot operate a business within this, the Island community. Yes. Is that, does the daycare will? It doesn't fall within that. It's still gonna supersede because the daycare home usually is a business. This is gonna supersede because it's sta state statute. So they can still run. They can still run that business. Yes. But there is a bill pending right now oh, yeah. in the legislature that allows toll-based businesses across the board, you know, but it's edit, uh, where you can still regulate things like parking, et cetera, but it would allow all of it. I don't know if it's gonna pass or not, but it's pending. Okay. okay. So one of the things you guys talked about a lot was some fake um, documents, right? So for the CC and arts, I come before that actually spread up and it's and this is awesome for you have pulled this up, but an event to allow four days instead of three can find their shares. We just draft to the document saying this is the amendments that you now just want instead of three that stays in the same San Jose. Is that for? So the question was, it sounds like your board amended the CCNRs to change the time frame for parking of certain vehicles. That is a violation of state law. That is not allowed. No matter what your documents say, what your declaration says, the board can never amend the declaration. That's only allowed by the owners. Only the owners can amend, and, and the statute said anywhere from 51% to 67% of the owners are required to amend the declaration. So if they have that, not the mitigation, it was the foaming agreeing to that, it was both amendment. So if they have the documentation for the owners agreeing to the amendment, it's going to depend on how they obtain that, that approval. I mean, because there's different ways to amend the declaration, and your documents might actually require you to do it a certain way, and they have to meet statutory time frames if they're doing it by mail ballot, so there's a lot of ifs for that. We're going to go till 7.30. Any any other questions while we're here? Yes, I'm going to let Amanda answer this one. I don't even know what it is. I know. Let's go. Oh, man. Do you see that? <laughs> All right. This is down on your What's your clients to tell <laughs> Are there resources available that have this language Chip. for okay. issues already uh, removed that could be available to boards of accessible uh, language or generally accepted? So it's language on some other issues. Yes and no. So when it comes to um, some of the resources that I would recommend, and I know I'm plugging our website, but it actually has a lot of good resources because we have the blog, the newsletters, and it'll kind of walk you through. You can type in the search bar what topic you want. So let's say it's voting by mail, and it'll pop up with kind of an overall parameters for doing so, and then links to the nonprofit voter Kiowa or whatever you need. When you get into things like a limited amendment, um, each one's different because even though like maybe they're all the same short-term rental right amendment but depending on the association's individual documents that's going to change the amendment so that i don't know of any fillable i know that we actually go through and look at all your documents and make sure it's in compliance with not only that and the law so that one's going to be a little harder harder um ballots you could probably do a google for like just your basic beating ballot and then fill that in that would be fine um ballots by mail that's different Okay, another workshop in June and September.